below. The next project we'll be working on is 10 string things. This is a project that incorporates both natural dyeing techniques and knot tying or weaving techniques. The first part of this demo will go over some elements of natural dyeing and I'll work you through dyeing with turmeric. From the lecture, we learned that natural dyes can be color fast or fugitive. Fugitive meaning that those dyes are not color fast. They might fade over time. They have less of a permanence that a color fast dye might be. In your toolkit, I provided you with two natural dye compounds. I provided you with a turmeric powder and a matter root powder. What's interesting about these two dyes is that one is color fast and one is fugitive. Now the turmeric dye that we'll be demonstrating here shortly is a fugitive dye, which means this color will fade over time and it is not permanent. Matter root is more of a color fast dye. This is a dye that if executed appropriately, will adhere to the fibers of your material and be more permanent in nature. You also have the opportunity to work and experiment with other types of natural dyes. The key here is that these are natural and not chemically driven. Some of you may have experience with dyeing already using some store-bought or chemical dyes like RIT dyes. If you've used these before, you'll find that there are some similar processes in preparing your material, in setting or fixing the dye to the fabric that you're working on. But for this project, we're gonna stick with natural dyes. It's better for um, the environment, it's better for ourselves, there's less toxicity involved, and something that's easy to do at home. So for this project, you are required to incorporate one element of natural dyeing. I'm gonna take you through turmeric because it's the most easy and most accessible, but you also have matter root if you choose to use the second. You can also look around in your kitchen or refrigerator and use some natural dyes. I'll put some links on Blackboard on some recipes and instructions for really accessible dyes where you can look them up on the internet. Some examples of different foods that you can use or different types of dyes that you might have lying around are black beans. Black beans create a really beautiful kind of purple quality when you use them in a dyeing. Uh, avocado skins, onion skins, uh, chamomile, teas, uh, black teas, wine, all of these things have different types of dyeing components. Now some of these and most of these are going to be fugitive in nature, which means they'll fade over time even if we use something to a fix. Um, but they do uh, create a vibrancy and a really interesting color. Uh, result. So it's up to you if you just want to stick with one of the dye powders that I included in your materials kit. But if you'd like to experiment, if you find that you're enjoying this process and want to include more different types of dyes, um, I invite you to do that. And uh, if you use more than one dye in your final projects for this, I will give you extra credit. So. The requirement is for one, if you choose to include others or you want to have some different colors in your project, I will give you extra credit. So I did want to talk about the different dyes I have here on the table. So I have turmeric, um, which is a root, and we are using the ground powder of that root. We also have matter root, which is a, um, a root that has been ground into a powder. Here you can see the root form of that, um, of that uh, vegetable-based dye, and then the powder. Some other natural dyes that you might have heard of or are familiar with are um, indigo, which is also a plant-based dye, and indigo creates some really rich blue tones. And you can vary the quality of blue that you get based on the quantity of the dye and how long you're letting your material soak in that bath. Some other dyes that um, are available on the market is something called cochineal, which is an animal-based dye. This is from an insect, 
and this creates a vibrant red or a vibrant pink color. And just a, a fact about cochineal is that that dye is often used in cosmetics and makeup. So a lot of the bright reds that you see in lipsticks or uh, other uh, commercial makeups have some cochineal derivatives in there. So that's important to know. But for this um, project, we will just be working with natural based dyes and plant or vegetable based fibers. In terms of fibers, there are two different types of fibers that you can use when you're working with natural dyeing. A plant or vegetable based fiber like cotton or linen or an animal based fiber like wool or silk. Again, for this project, we are going to stick to the plant-based fibers, but if you want to go out and experiment more or purchase some of these different fibers, you are welcome to do that. So I have some examples just to show you of the difference between kind of a cotton-based fiber and a wool. So I have um, just uh, used some of my scrap muslin, which is a cotton-based material, to create some swatches. You'll see the cotton, it's a tight weave um, and it's very, it's a lot denser. There's less transparency with the cotton. I also have a wool based material, which has a little bit of a lighter density. There is a little bit of a transparency, so it has less of that opaque quality and it's a more open weave. Now the weave is the element that pull the fibers together and create um, that material, the fabric that we'll be using. I also wanted to show the difference between um, different types of wool and the cotton core. And so this is a piece of wool roving, it's undyed, it's very raw. This is something that would then be spun into yarn that someone might use for a knitting project. You might also have seen this a lot recently with folks who are making really big chunky bracelets or doing some type of arm knitting. I also have here a looser piece of wool roving that's much more raw and much less processed. And this might be something that someone might use if they're felting. And felting is a technique where you use a tool, a felting needle that is a tool that has several different needles um, with, with tiny little latches in them that you punch through this roving into the material behind it, which embeds the wool and can create patterns and designs that way. In your toolkits, you have cotton-based rope and cord of different dimensions. And so you have a three millimeter and a four millimeter. And so I've made a few hanks of that cord here. And a hank is just a term of a loosely coiled or loosely wrapped um, uh, yarn or rope or cord. And so what I would like for you to do as you prepare for your dyeing project, as you are um, thinking about how you want to incorporate the natural dyes into your rope, is to loosely wrap your cord into a hank when you are putting it in your dye bath. So before you get started, you always want to make sure that you have all of your materials ready and on hand. I also want to talk a little bit about PPE, which we have all grown accustomed to, which is personal protection equipment. And when you're working with natural dyes, again, there is less toxicity, there's less chemicals that we have to worry about. It's much better for our health and it's better for the environment and any type of wastewater runoff. However, with some of these materials, you still don't want to inhale them. As an artist, especially an artist working in three dimensions and sometimes two dimensions, you're exposed to a lot of different materials that can sometimes affect your health. And so the different types of PPE that I want to talk about today are different types of respirators or masks. And so over the last few years, we've become really familiar with KN95 or N95 masks. And these are really masks that reduce dust. They filter dust and any particulates that come into the air. But often you're still receiving fumes. So if you've noticed that you're wearing these masks and you can still smell, it's because those fumes aren't filtered, but the dust particulates in the air are. So for this assignment, 
At one point, I would like you to use one of these dust masks to make sure that you're not inhaling some of the materials that we'll be using. Now, a respirator is something that you'll want to use if you're using any other type of material that might have fumes that could be problematic. Certain glues have some really caustic and toxic fumes, um, things like resin. If you're ever working uh, with carving or styrofoam, you're gonna wanna use a respirator because these are elements that we can inhale through our lungs and can be really, really problematic. The other thing I wanna talk about is the different materials, the different tools that you will be using for this project. Natural dyes are something that you can do just in your kitchen. I've worked with natural dyes in my kitchen plenty of times, but I do want to go over some of the tools, some of the equipment that you'll be using while you're working with these dyes. So you're going to want a big pot that's big enough to hold the amount of water you need to dye your rope. So this is just a, a, about a 10 quart crock pot. This is something that you uh, might already have in your kitchen, but it's also something that you can just grab at the store. Uh, I have two here that I'll be using, one for the scouring of that, and then also the mordant that, which I'll talk about, and then also finally to use as we're creating the dye vat for our project. I also have here some single tabletop burners, but if you're doing this in your kitchen, you could just use your stove top. Now, because turmeric and matter are both ground root powders, sometimes there's uh, elements that are left in that dye that can transfer onto the fiber and make the fiber have different particulates. And so we wanna strain the dye bath before we actually use it to dye our materials. And so what I do is I have a cap colander here, and then above in that colander, I place just a cheesecloth or any type of gauze. It's important to know that these, this material will become dyed itself, and so this can just be thrown away. Cheesecloth is something that you can get just at the grocery store. It's usually in um, the baking section or the cooking section, and it's, very, it's a very cheap material. Uh, you can also use a strainer. Um, uh, the strainer also will sit right on top of your pan. Um, usually these strainers hold a little bit um, of a lesser quality of material, but this is another great tool and usually this is a finer sieve than with the colander. Now these are dyes, so they're going to dye everything they come into contact with, your skin, your clothes. So you wanna make sure that you're wearing something to protect your clothing or you're wearing clothing that is junky and you don't care about. So I have an apron on to protect my clothing. I also have tongs that I will be using inside the water, whether it's hot, because we will be working with boiling water here, or if I wanted to take out the material as it was being dyed. You also can use a spoon to stir your um, dye when it's uh, uh, in your vat bath, or you can use the tongs for that as well. A measuring, a measuring spoon, and then I forgot my measuring cup today, so I'll be using um, an old uh, salsa container uh, that I know is 16 ounces, so I can measure from there. But a measuring cup, a measuring spoon, and your tools. You also wanna make sure you're wearing gloves when you're coming into contact with the dye, whether in its raw state as a powder, because even as a powder it can dye, or as you're working with it in your bath bath. I have a couple of different gloves here, just your common um, latex gloves, a little heavier duty latex gloves that you might wanna use as you're um, finishing your dye bath when you're squeezing that dye out of, uh, or when you're squeezing uh, the water out of the dye once that dye has set. And again, your PPE. Now, a mordant is a chemical agent or a compound that is added to the dye to allow the dye to affix to the fiber itself. With some of these dyes, they need a little bit of an agent to allow the fibers to open up and accept that dye to create that color fast quality, to really adhere the dye to the fabric. With turmeric, you don't need any type of mordant. That dye itself has enough 
um, different materials to be able to affix to the fabric, but something like matter root or some other dyes that you might be using will require a mordant. If you're looking at different dyes online, it will let you know if a mordant is needed. And again, that mordant is a chemical agent, it's an additive. It allows um, the uh, dye to fix itself to, to affix to the fiber itself. And it's done through a chemical process that changes um, the nature of the relationship between the dye and the fiber. Now, some people might think that vinegar, you might have heard of vinegar being used as a mordant. Vinegar isn't actually a mordant. It actually changes the pH of the vat bath, but sometimes vinegar, vinegar can be used post dyeing process to help affix that dye so it's more color fast. But if you're using mordant, if you've scoured your material well enough, you won't need to use that. I do want to share a few examples of mordants that you might use or things that you can commonly find. So first is alum, and this is also in your toolkit. And alum is a chemical compound that's very accessible. It's um, not, uh, it's the least toxic, I should say, of any of the different types of mordant agents that you might be using. Um, but this is also one that if you're using it, especially in powder form, you're gonna want to wear your respirator because any of this alum, you're not gonna want to leave it into your respiratory system. Alum is used commonly in foods um, and it's generally very, very safe, but also with your skin when you're touching it, um, you, you don't wanna have too much exposure on your skin with this material. This is a very common mordant. Uh, we will be using it today, even though with the turmeric, we don't need a mordant. It's not gonna hurt the dye. And I'm gonna show you how to use it just in case you wanna use this with your matter root, or if you're going to be experimenting with the black beans or any other types of or walnuts or any other types of natural dye that you find. And then the other additive is a washing soda. So this washing soda is used in the scouring process. And that's the process that prepares the material, the fiber, to receive the dye. Now this is really, really important to do in both cotton, vegetable-based uh, fibers or animal-based fibers because during the processing and production and even shipping of some of these materials, they may be exposed to, to certain agents that diminish the quality of the fiber to receive that dye in a consistent way. And so you just want to clean it thoroughly. And scouring is really just cleaning the fiber in the best way. And for scouring, you want to use a really, really gentle detergent and a washing soda. Now, washing soda is different than baking soda. Washing soda is a soda ash. Arm & Hammer makes one. You can probably find it at the grocery store. If you can't find this washing soda, you may also have it at Michael's or Blaine's. Uh, just use a really gentle detergent to make sure you're thoroughly washing or scouring those fibers. And I'll show you how to do that as well. I am ready to start scouring my fiber and I'm gonna be scouring some hanks of the cotton rope cord uh, that I put together. Now again, scouring is just a way of really cleaning your material to get rid of any type of particulates or any extra fibers or dust or anything that might have compromised that material during transit or production. So I have my vat of water here and I just filled the pot with enough water to fully saturate my um, my hanks of fiber here. I don't have it filled to the top. It's about halfway. Again, this is about a 10 quart pot, um, which is about two and a half gallons. And the recipe for scouring is really based on the amount of water that you have. You can also base it on the weight of your material. So for this exercise, we're gonna use about two to three teaspoons per gallon. And because this isn't full, I'm gonna say this is a gallon, and that's gonna be about three teaspoons of that soda ash, three teaspoons, which is also a tablespoon. Um, and then it's a little less for the detergent. It's one to two teaspoons of detergent per gallon. I'm gonna say we're gonna go with two teaspoons here because this, this water is, is not, it's not full. Now the detergent that I'm using, I tried to find a really simple, clean, Bio Clean. It's free of any fragrance or dyes um, and it's free and clear. So 
So just get the most simple type of detergent. It could be a laundering detergent like this is. It could be a dishwashing detergent. But you just want to make sure it doesn't have any added oils or any added aromas or anything like that. Now I put my gloves on because soda ash can be a little bit caustic if it's on your hands. So just make sure you're wearing gloves when you're using that. And I'm also gonna put one of my dust masks on because I don't wanna be inhaling this as I scoop it out. So I am going to start with my detergent. And again, I'm gonna use about one to two teaspoons per gallon. I'm gonna just use two teaspoons. Just kind of estimate with my tablespoon here. I'll use my tongs to kind of stir that detergent into the water. And now I'm going to add that one to three teaspoons of washing soda. Uh, Three teaspoons is a tablespoon, so I'm going to go with one tablespoon for my vat, my scouring vat here. And again, just make sure you're wearing your dust mask and not inhaling the particulates of the soda ash. I'm going to add that to my vat as well. Stir it up. I'm going to turn on my vat. So I started without the water warm. I started with the water at room temperature. Once I've added my different agents, I will turn it on. And our goal is to bring it up to a high heat or close to a boil. Now with these plant-based or vegetable-based fibers, we don't have to worry too much about monitoring that temperature. If you are working with wool or an animal-based fiber, you're really gonna wanna make sure that you're monitoring that temperature of your water with like a food thermometer, because if your water or your dye vat goes above 180 degrees, it could compromise your fiber, if it's an animal-based fiber. Animal-based fibers are a little bit more finicky, a little bit more delicate. They don't really respond well to great temperature changes or intense heat. So moving from hot to cold might shock those fibers and compromise them. Bringing them above 180 might shock and compromise them as well. Now I wanna show you what the inside of your vat will look like after you add the washing soda and the detergent. You can see it's creating a little bit of a white surface, a little bit of a white film. That's totally okay. That's what it should be doing. And I'm allowing that water to heat up. While it's doing its work, I'm going to add my hanks of my different ropes and cords into the bath. Now there's not much that you need to do here in terms of agitating the material as it's in. You can just let it sit there and allow the different agents, the soda ash and the detergent to work on cleaning that material. So we're gonna let this sit and you're gonna, you're gonna watch that to make sure nothing boils over too much. You wanna make sure it's on a high heat but not anything excessive. Um, so you're gonna wanna monitor it to make sure it doesn't, doesn't boil over. You wanna really keep it at a high heat and a simmer of that high heat. Um, and we're gonna let it sit there for an hour. Um, depending on your material and the quality of your material, uh, you might scour something for anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours. So just a progress of the scouring process, you can already see some of particulates coming out into the water and the water becoming a little bit more murky. This is really cleaning the materials um, from any type of 
irritants or any type of particulates or dust or um, dirt that uh, was in the material. So we're gonna let this sit for a little bit longer. Just wanted to show you an in-process shot. Okay, it's been about an hour with uh, my fibers in the scouring bath. And in just a moment, I will show you the quality of the water to show you the debris and the particulates that were pulled out of the material. My next step will be to rinse the materials in water uh, to clear away any of the detergent remaining. Okay, as you can see, that water is a little bit grimy. Um, uh, it has done its job in cleaning the fibers um, and cleaning my rope and cord. And so next I'm going to go to the sink and I'm going to rinse them out and be right back. I'm just going to rinse them in cold water. of mordanting. And again, the mordanting process is just enabling the fiber to better absorb the dye and to have that dye adhere to the fibers. It's a chemical process and it changes that interaction and the relationship between the dye and the chemical mordant agent. If you are using turmeric for your project, you can skip this step. Turmeric does not need alum. Turmeric contains its own natural tannins that helps that uh, dye affix to the fiber. I will be using alum in my turmeric bath just to show you how to use it in case you want to use alum as a mordant for matter root or any other type of dye that you might experiment with. You'll find that there are several recipes for creating a mordant bath. So the one that I will be using is two to four teaspoons of alum per 100 grams of material or 100 grams of the weight of your fiber. That's about a quarter pound, which is what I've assessed my fiber to be. So if you have a bigger bunch, if you have a pound, you'd be using anywhere from eight to 16 teaspoons and the equivalent of that. So for mine, I've assessed this is about a quarter pound. I'm going to use two to four teaspoons um, or just over a tablespoon to prepare my mordant. So again, alum is not something you want to ingest or inhale, so I'm going to use my PPE as I measure this out. I'm going to first dissolve it into room temperature water before I add it to my bath. And so I'm going to go ahead and heat up my alum mordant bath while I prepare the um, alum. I'm just working in advance to make sure all of that alum, alum dissolves. If you have a whisk, that comes in really handy right now. I'm going to let my water heat up and then I will add the alum milk. My water has heated up and so I'm going to add my alum to my mordant vat. And next I will add my scoured fiber hanks. Now remember, if you're using wool or an animal-based fiber, you want to be really cautious of the temperature of the material and the water. You don't ever want to shock that material by putting something that's cooled into hot 
So you'll want to bring that temperature up slowly with the animal fiber in, but cotton is a little bit more forgiving in that way. So now we have our fiber cord in our vat bath, and we're gonna let that sit for 45 minutes. We have that in our mordant bath, and we're gonna let that sit for 45 minutes. There's lots of recipes online that might suggest letting it sit for about two hours, but for this exercise, 45 minutes is good to go. Another note about working with animal fibers, if you are using wool or silk or something like that in your exercises for this project, make sure not to bring that temperature above 180 degrees so you will need a thermometer because that heat will compromise the integrity of the fibers. My fiber has now been in the mordant bath for over 45 minutes and it's ready to be rinsed out and prepared for the dye vat. Remember to always wear your gloves when working with the mordant or the soda ash um, just to protect your skin um, from that agent. So I'm gonna go ahead and have water, room temperature so as not to shock the fiber. And you just wanna be very careful when you're wringing out the material. Just be gentle with it. I've provided you with about three to four tablespoons of turmeric to get you started. This could be enough to carry you through. You can always add more depending on the richness of the turmeric you're trying to desire. The outcomes of turmeric can be a light yellow to a vibrant yellow orange. So it really, really depends on how much turmeric you're using, how long you are letting your objects or your fibers sit in that dye bath. So with turmeric, you can get it at the grocery store, at bulk, you could get it at Costco if you need more, but you do have enough to get you started or enough to carry you through depending on the richness and capacity of color you're looking for. I also wanted to show some examples of the outcomes of turmeric dye next to kind of a commercial rich dye. These are some dance shoes that I dyed um, recently. And this one you can see was dyed commercially with a rich dye, um, and the color is less vibrant that that was done with turmeric. So turmeric, although it's a natural fiber and it is fugitive, it does have some really, really vibrant outcomes. So there's a couple of steps that you can take with dyeing your turmeric. I'm going to prepare my turmeric and then I'm going to strain it and strain out any of uh, the particulates that might be left in the dye before I submerge my materials. I'm doing that because if I don't, sometimes there are chunks or little elements of the root that are left from the ground that appear on your fiber. It's hard to get that out post dyeing process. So it's a little bit more in time intensive because you're making your dye bath, straining it, and then using it. But we're just gonna go ahead and do that so that we can make sure we get the best quality in our fiber. So make sure you have your water heated up. I'm gonna turn mine all the way to high. You don't want this to be a rolling boil, but you do want it to be high heat and simmer boil. Now again, turmeric stains um, in its dry form as well as its wet forms. You really, really wanna make sure here in this step that you're wearing gloves and that you have something on to protect your clothing because turmeric gets everywhere. Um, it is a fugitive dye, so it is not permanent. Um, it will fade over time, it will fade in direct sunlight, but it gets everywhere. So make sure you have gloves on while you're handling the powder and any time that you're hand handling the bag. So with turmeric dye, um, you can use anywhere from a few tablespoons to a pound. It really depends, again, on that richness of the color opacity that you're trying to get. We've got a quarter pound here. I can um, use 
you know, anywhere from three to four tablespoons. I'm gonna go ahead and put in four. That's about as much as you all have in your packets. So we'll start with four. If you want a real rich, vibrant color, add up to a quarter pound, three quarter pounds um, of turmeric, uh, but just a few tablespoons um, will get you started in a nice, rich color. So we've got about four tablespoons in this bag, and I'm going to stir this. My turmeric bat is ready to be strained and the next step we'll add our rope and cord to the bat. This is the last step in the dye process before we can introduce our cord and rope to the turmeric dye. So I am using a sink. I have my colander with cheesecloth and I'm setting that over um, my stock pot. You could use a bucket if you don't have an extra pot. Um, or sometimes even a Rubbermaid as long as the water isn't too hot. And this is where you wanna make sure you have your protective clothing on, you have gloves, you have an apron, or you're not wearing great clothes because there can be some um, splashing from the turmeric and it will die and stain. You wanna control the turmeric as it goes in so it doesn't pull that cheesecloth down over the colander. You can see some of that, those granular particulates are still there. It's a really good um, step to make sure you're stirring continuously during that 45 minutes or hour, as long as you're letting it sit, so you break down some of those particulates. I did not do a good enough job of that, and so there's a lot remaining, which is unfortunate because you lose some of those colors and tannins from that. Okay, so next we're gonna pull up our cheesecloth here and squeeze out any excess. Make sure your water is not too hot because you can burn yourself in this process. And there is our dye vat. We have our strained turmeric and the next step will be to introduce our fibers to the pot. I did provide you with some cotton to create some color swatches. You can use this to test the color as you're working with it, or also to test the opacity of some different materials that you might be experimenting with, such as black beans, onion skins, avocado, what have you, to really kind of gauge where you are and to see if you need to allow your fiber to sit in that bath longer, or if it's reached the level of saturation that you are looking for. We're gonna now submerge our rope into the vat bag. Now, even though we strained out much of the particulates, it's a good opportunity to just go in and stir this pot occasionally to make sure that um, there isn't any kind of settling of the turmeric at the bottom. And you can see color is already taking. Um, the longer you leave this in, the richer the color is going to be. So I'm gonna make sure that mine is set to high and I'm just gonna let this sit for about 45 minutes and then I'll check in with it. Turmeric is something that you could also turn the heat off and let your rope or cord sit even overnight. It's not gonna hurt the, um, the product, it's not gonna hurt the fiber and it'll just allow that the different tannins and the different dyes to penetrate that fiber even more deeply. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, throw in a test swatch as well at this stage. And then I can use that to help gauge how long these have been in there. So I'm gonna leave this on high. I'm gonna cover it to keep that intensity inside and I'll check back on this every five minutes or so to make sure I'm constantly stirring and not letting things settle like I did before. My cords have now been soaking in this warm bath bath 
for about two hours and I will show you the color opacity that we were able to achieve in just this short amount of time. Again, this is something you can leave sitting overnight depending on the kind of color saturation that you're hoping to achieve. After just two hours in the turmeric bath, you can see how bright and vibrant this color is. The steps we took to get here was first scouring our fiber to make sure it was clean and free from any debris or particles. Next, we set it into a mordant bath, which prepared the fiber to receive the dye that uh, we were using and to create more of a fixture of that dye. And then we um, set our turmeric, strained our turmeric, and then placed our fiber into that bath. You can see that this is very bright, vibrant. It may diminish a little bit once we rinse it. You can also add cream of tartar to your natural dyes during the vat dye process to enhance some of the vibrancy of the color. I did not do that with turmeric. Turmeric is pretty vibrant on its own, but you may wanna use cream of tartar if you're working with a different fiber or a different dye, excuse me, such as matter root. So the next step is I'm gonna run this under the wash and rinse out the turmeric. Now you could keep this turmeric um, overnight if you wanted to reuse it for another batch or another vat, um, but it won't last very long. It, you know, it is a natural, uh, natural plant-based material and it will break down over time. But you can reuse this if you don't want, to, want it to go to waste. Um, you can even experiment with freezing it and um, using it afterwards. So I'm just going to remove my hanks. Again, oops, there was some splash, so always important to wear your um, junky clothes or aprons. All right, I think I've got it all. And again, the hank is just a loosely um, woven or loosely coiled piece of fiber. Next step is to run it under cool water until it runs clear. You can see some of that turmeric coming out. That's normal. That's just normal. And again, you want to be gentle with your fibers. You don't want to squeeze them too much or wring them out. Just be very, very gentle. You can see the final result of the turmeric dye process. The color is very, very bright, vibrant. I left it in the vat for two hours. I intended only 45 minutes, but the time just went by. It's a very, very vibrant yellow. You can see some areas where there is a little bit more of that orange coming through. Um, you can again leave this um, sit as long as overnight um, and just make sure that you rinse it thoroughly before, um, before you set it somewhere. Uh, turmeric. Uh, again, is a fugitive dye, so it will fade over time, but it will get on everything. It'll get on your skin, your clothing, on surfaces, etc. So be really mindful about where you're placing this. If you run it through the dryer, even if you've rinsed it thoroughly, even if you did an extra step of setting it in vinegar, um, it may also rub off on uh, other elements in the dryer. So be mindful of that. I would just leave it out to air dry until you're ready to use it. The two components to the 10 String Things project is to utilize knot making or wrapping or weaving, and then also a component of natural dyeing. This next demo will cover a few techniques that you can use when you're creating your 10 String Things objects. So these objects are intended to be done with string, rope, cord, and nothing else. No knitting needles, no crochet hooks, no machinery, just your hands and your materials. 
I have provided you with some rope and some cord for you to use. It is a natural fiber, it is a natural color cotton. I do encourage you to use some other rope or cord or yarn that you find. The only stipulation is that you keep it in the natural cotton tone, this very neutral tone that can accept dye and colors and won't compete with the colors that you're achieving through your dyes. So natural cotton color, um, unbleached where you can find it with any type of yarn or wool or rope that you find. Um, so for instance, colored yarn that's already dyed is not acceptable. Any type of rope, like a jute rope that um, uh, is not natural cotton is not acceptable. So I'm gonna take you through a few techniques that you can apply to your 10 string things project. I'll show you how to finger weave, which is weaving with your hands without any other tools. And then I'll also show you a couple macrame knots. Now, as we learned in the lecture, there are thousands of knots that you can use and thousands of different macrame techniques. And these are different types of weaving and knotting techniques that span across all continents and um, uh, all time. So I'll really only just show you a few things that you can use, but I really encourage you to do your own research and to look at the different types of knotting techniques that you can find and apply to this, and also the different types of weaving, arm knitting, finger weaving that you can find. What I'll show you is just a few really simple techniques, and then I encourage you to expand on this more as you're developing these 10 string thing objects. And these objects, can be functional. They can be something made out of yarn or string that you can wear or use. They can also be totally abstract and just based on uh, the different knots and tying and weaving that, that you'll do or the different ways that you're putting these things together. Again, using only your hands and using only the materials provided to you. So the idea is to create these objects that are interesting. Half of them will be required to have some type of dye incorporated, even if it's in a small way, even if it's just dyeing the ends versus dyeing the whole, the, the whole object. Half will be undyed, so you're utilizing just shape and form and a sense of creating movement and flow by the weaving and knotting and wrapping that you will do. So five undyed, five incorporating some type of natural dye that you'll come up with, at least with turmeric, with others if you decide to experiment. First, I will take you through a really simple intro to finger weaving. With finger weaving, you're gonna to wanna to start with yarn or your rope. I'm gonna go ahead and use a yarn. This is a wool yarn that was dyed with indigo in a gradated manner. So the first thing you wanna do is take the tail of your yarn and hold it between your thumb and your pointer finger. You're then going to take the long end and wrap it around your middle finger, under your ring finger, and over your pinky. You'll then go back around over your ring finger, under your middle finger, over your pointer. So you'll see there's one row of yarn woven around your fingers. You'll then take it back over your middle finger, under your ring finger, over your pinky, and back again until you see two rows on each finger. The next step is where you'll start the weaving process. You will take the bottom row move it up over your finger. You can use this to tighten so that that weave is tight. And then you'll move through. Under, over, under, over. So now we will repeat over the middle finger, under the ring finger, over the pinky, over the ring finger, under the middle finger, over the pointer finger, two rows, and we will take the bottom row over the top, 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 and repeat.
bottom over, bottom over, bottom over. And repeat. You can also pull this cord to help tighten the weave in the back. Now we don't see what's happening yet, that'll come next. And repeat. Over, under, over, over, under, over. So now let's take a look and we can see that weave starting. So we'll just keep continuing. Okay, I am coming to the end of my yarn. And for what I'm doing, this is the length that I'm looking for. You can go longer for depending on what your project is going to be or how you would incorporate this weave. So to cast off, we just need to end each, each row. So we're gonna start with the weave around our pointer finger. We're gonna take that off, put it around our middle finger, tighten that string, and pull the bottom up and over. Next, we're gonna take this weave, put it over our pointer finger, take that bottom row up and over, and we're gonna do the, flat, the same thing with the ring and pointer. We're gonna bring it up over our pinky, and then we're gonna go up, top, and then we have our last knot. You will then take the end, you have your last knot, you can take that off your finger, take the tail of your yarn, and put it through. You now have your tail finished. You will want to make a knot on this when you are ready. And so you can see the weave from this. Once you complete your finger weave, you now have an element that you can incorporate into a string thing object. Just completing the finger weave itself is not a completed object. This is just a tool and another technique that you can use as you create your string thing. So turning this in would not qualify as one complete object, but you can use this and incorporate this and modify this into some other type of form. You can make something that's functional. Um, you know, you could do several and make a head wrap. You can make a scarf or a cowl, um, but just one row would not be enough as one of the objects.
You can also use this to make something completely abstracted, something that's interesting in shape or form. So that is your demo on how to finger weave. Next up, I will show you a couple of macrame techniques. The first knot I will show you is the most basic in macrame. It's the lark heads knot, and it is what attaches your cord or rope to whatever you're using to build from. I have a knitting needle, you could use anything here, a pencil, pen, um, really anything. And so for this, I'm working with a 24 inch piece of rope just for the sake of this demonstration. The length of rope you work with will depend on your project and what you're hoping to do. So I've taken that ro rope and I've bended it in half to create a loop at the top. I'm going to take that loop over the top of the tool, take the two tails, weave it under and pull it through with the standard Lark's knot you will see the top of the loop across the two tails. You can also do a reverse lark's head knot, which will take that loop from behind and pull your tails forward so the tails appear. This is the most basic knot when you're starting with macrame. The next macrame knot I'll show you is the basic square knot. So for this, I've added a second Lark's Head knotted rope cord to mine. So I have two separate side-by-side -side cords and I'm gonna make sure they're close by each other. And this knot will be weaving or knotting the left one to the right one or vice versa, depending on where you wanna start. So for this, we'll push these two together and we will separate the outside cords from the inside center cords. We'll start on our left and we're gonna rotate left to right, left to right. So this is a basic square knot. There is a half square knot variety. I will show you about halfway down, but this is the basic square knot. So we're gonna start with our left. We're gonna go over the center but we're gonna go under the right. And then we're gonna take that right and go under the center, but then over the left. And you'll see the knot is above that center cord, and you're just gonna push that up to the top. We were started on our left, so now we'll go to the right and we'll repeat that pattern. We go over the center, under the left, now the left goes under the center, but over the right to create that knot. And we will scoot that knot up. So that was our right. Now we'll go to our left, over the center, under the right. And the right goes under the center, over the left, all right. We'll repeat that with the right, over the center, under the left. The left goes over the center, under the right. over the center, under the left, and the left goes under the center, over the right. So this would be your basic square knot. The next variation I will show you, I will start midway to your half square knot. It is the same process, 
but using only one of these as your starter. So you won't be rotating left to right. So we're gonna start with the left and this will create a natural curve that happens. So again, left over center, under right, right under and over. So if we were doing our basic knot, we would now start with the right, but since we're doing the half square, we're back to the left, over, under, under, over. Over, under, under, over. And we can already see it starting to curve. Over, under, under, over. And make sure to pull that down. Over, under, under, over. It gets a little tricky here because it starts to, to curve, but you can see that happening. So make sure you're keeping track of what your left is versus your right. So we're going to be going over, under, under, over. So we want to make sure we're at the left again. So you may just want to turn this. We're going over, under, under, over. And our left over, under, under, over. Over, under, under, over. All right. So you can see the difference there from the basic square knot, which creates a very solid square shape to where we did the half square that starts to get this spiral type of shape. This next knot is called a Josephine knot. It's a little bit more advanced, but quite simple once you get the hang of it. And again, you're gonna be starting with two separate cords in the Lark's knot position. And this one is, um, lots of weaving before you pull the knot together. So you're going to start with the right and you're going to make a loop of the right over itself, making sure you keep those cords neat and tidy because that is really essential in this. So you're going to take that and you're going to put that over your left so you can see the left through it. Now this is nothing knotted you're simply making a curve and laying that over your next step is to take your left string over the tails of your right and then you're going to start to weave it it's going to go over then under and now you're just going to look for the openings in the knot. So it's gone over, under. We're gonna go over the center curve and then back under through. So then we carefully pull and clean off your sides so you have a pretty Josephine knot. We'll do it again. All right. We'll do it one more time. On the right, we're making a loop of its own. And we are keeping that rope and that cord neat and we're curving over itself. So no knot or weaving happened. So we're making a very simple curve. And then we're setting that opening over on top of our left side rope. Then we begin to weave. We take our left and we curve it 
over the tails of our right. And then we're just gonna follow the different patterns we have here. So over the tails of our right, and then under the top of our right. And now we're going over this center and we're gonna go under our left. So over the center right, under the left. And you can see that forming here. And we're gonna just neatly pull this together. And that's our Josephine knot. You may want to experiment with a thicker cords or thicker rope or yarn when you're working with this one. Okay, the last knot I'm going to show you is the Pippa knot. This is a knot that's Chinese in origin. So you're going to start with a long piece of cord or rope and I recommend for a Pippa knot to use something that's a little bit thicker and sturdier and chunkier. So you're going to start with a short end on your right and the longer end on your left and you're going to take that long end and wrap it around itself to make a little loop with the long end over the short end and make that loop pretty small. This will be the top of your Pippa knot. It's going to create a teardrop shape. So you want this top loop to be small. And then you're going to take the long string and create the bottom loop. The, the long string will create the bottom loop. It almost creates an ampersand sign or a cursive S. And now this bottom is really gonna determine the overall size of your Pippa knot. So you wanna make your correction for that here because you won't be able to change it moving forward. Make sure you keep your top finger or make sure you're holding that top part of your loop because there is no knotting that goes into this part to keep that in place. So once you have your size, you are moving, you are keeping that long string over and you are crossing the front on top. Again, it's just layering it. You're not doing any weaving or knotting yet. So just layered over the top. And then you're gonna take that behind your upper loop and you're gonna move it above. So you can start to see this layering that's happening at the top. And for the bottom part of your Pippa knot, you are going to follow the inside pattern of your rope. So it nestles inside. And then you're gonna take it behind your top loop. Make sure everything's tight there. and you're gonna go forward, nestled inside. You're gonna follow that up and back around, following your own pattern. And then once you get to the center here, let's try to make it go one more time here. We're gonna go up and around and then once we get to the center, we're going to feed our cord through that center and pull it through. And then neaten this up. And there you have the Pippa knot. You can make this bigger if you're interested to in doing that, but make sure that you are using a sizable um, 
a sizable cord. Otherwise, as you can see, it does have a tendency of getting a little bit flimsy. And there is the Pippa knot. That is the demo for some natural dyeing techniques and some weaving and knotting techniques. Please let me know if you have any questions as you move through this assignment and this project. As a reminder, the project is to have finished 10 string things that are achieved by only using your hands and the rope or cord. Um, and again, these are natural cords, um, natural ropes. You can use yarn um, in the making of your string things, but make sure that yarn is undyed, that it's raw cotton, a natural cotton color. No yarns that have been pre-treated with dye. Of those 10 string things, at least five of those objects have to incorporate some component of natural dyeing. You're required to use one type of natural dye and in your toolkits you have turmeric and matter root. You only have to use one. But if you use two or more, you will receive extra credit. Again, some really great natural dyes to look up and, and check to see if you have in, in your kitchen berries, blackberries are great, black beans, walnut, onion seeds, avocado skins, all of these create really wonderful vibrant colors. I will put some resources in discussion board so you can do your own investigation into uh, some natural dyes that you might want to incorporate. In thinking about your objects for the 10 string things, think about them in terms of abstract forms and shapes and how you can use these materials together, whether it's the dyeing or the, the cord or rope, how can you use those materials together to create some type of interesting shape or form? The objects can be functional, but they don't need to be. You're making 10 distinct objects that are made just from string and your hands. So no knitting needles, no crochet hooks, no machines, just your hands and the rope to create some type of object. I do have a station set up at UAA in the sculpture studio and that includes some extra dies, some extra rope and cord if you're short, and some of the tools like the stock pots and tongs, a burner, etc. So if you don't have the right tools or equipment at your house and you're comfortable with going to the sculpture lab, you're welcome to do that. Just make sure to check in with Hans, who's the sculpture lab tech. Just a final note that when you are working with natural dyes, you wanna make sure that you're working with equipment that you are then not using for food. So go to the thrift store, find some cheap um, pots or pans or tongs and use those so that you're not cross-contaminating anything that might be food safe. I really look forward to seeing your 10 string things. Contact me if you have any questions. Have a wonderful week.